preseason is in the books. A fourth quarter comeback victory over the Hornets. Did we get clarity on Eric Spolstra's rotations? Whose stock is rising? We give you our takeaways on the game. Plus, what did the results of the annual NBA GM survey say about the Heat? We break it all down in today's episode of Locked on Heat. You are locked on Heat. Your daily Miami Heat podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. All right, welcome to Locked On Heat, your daily podcast on the Miami Heat. I'm Wes Goldberg. Joining me as always, it's Dave Vermill. However, you're tuning in on YouTube, Odyssey, or on your favorite podcast app. Thanks so much for making Locked On Heat your first listen every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Jace Medical. Empower yourself when you purchase a Jace case, providing you with a personal supply of five antibiotics that treat 50 plus infections. Get yours today at jacemedical.com. That's J A S E medical.com. We're going to get into Jaime Hakka's junior, Cole Swider, other players whose stock is rising after Miami's first preseason game, plus NBA GMs disrespecting Bam Adebayo. We're going to talk about all that in a second. But let's start with our big takeaways from the Heat's preseason opener against the Hornets. They win that game 113-109. to David, you and I are here at Kaseya Center uh, for the first preseason game. Recapping this game, we thought that we might learn how Spo was leaning with the starting lineup tonight. It was one of the things that everybody was watching. Uh, except with no Jimmy Butler, no Caleb Martin, who were, Caleb Martin was out with a with knee tendonitis. Right. Uh, Jimmy Butler was out because he didn't want to be here. Right. Uh, and Spo basically used this opportunity to just don't let him know what your next move is, right? Like that's what they're doing. And so instead of starting one of Kyle Lowry or Josh Richardson and giving us clarity as to who the starting point guard for this team is going to be, he's like, you know what? How about this? I'm just going to start both of them. So we have no idea uh, who is going to be the starter uh, when games really matter. Um, so it was hard to glean much because of that uh, in terms of what to expect, not only out of the starting lineup, but out of the rotation. Yep. Spo played 15 different guys tonight. Uh, and and let's just jump right into the preseason takeaways. And David, mine is that I think this preseason is going to be the most important preseason in recent memory for these Miami Heat for a lot of different reasons. First, they're, they're trying to build off of last year's finals run after what was not a very good regular season. They're trying to figure out, okay, can we be more of the postseason team and less of the regular season team? They're replacing two key players in Gabe Vincent and Max Struess. They did not make the offseason addition that they probably thought they were going to make. Right. And they bring back a, a team that is also trying to replenish that developmental pipeline, right? And so there's a lot of different things going on here that they've got to figure out. And frankly, I... I don't know. We're going to get into Jaime Hakas and Cole Swider and some of the, and Nikola Jovic and some of these other guys later on. But I don't know that the fifth best player on the team right now is all that much better than the 13th best player on the team. If you're talking about just like where they stack up in the depth chart and in the pecking order. And so I think Spo is going to have to use this preseason to just figure out quite just point blank. Who are my best 10 guys and who am I going to be playing on a nightly basis and, and and we've got we got a few glimpses tonight. Some people stood out more than others, uh, but I think this preseason is just going to be so important for Eric Spolster and for the Miami Heat for that reason. It's a good point. A lot of new faces, and and you wouldn't think so. I, I, you know, earlier today, waiting to catch the elevator to our seats up in Media Row, and a fan came by and said, "Oh, a lot of new faces," and I was like, "You know." They are, actually, and it's not something you would expect because there is some consistency, but that really starts off with Bam, Jimmy, and Tyler, and yet to some extent Kyle and Duncan, although their roles are a little bit less defined and as and less uh, prominent as those other three players. But you've got Kevin Love here, his first full season with the team, Josh Richardson coming back into a new redefined role, Highsmith mm. with more minutes, all these other guys competing for opportunities and minutes. And so you have to figure out where these lineups match up best, what players can play alongside anybody else. And so there's a lot more turnover there. It's a really good point. It is, I think, much more challenging for Eric Spolster, probably something he embraces and enjoys, to be quite honest. But yeah. I think there's a lot of different – Again, iterations of yes. these different rosters and all the versatility that he's been talking about all training camp long and even tonight. And I think we're going to see that on display throughout the preseason. So it, it, it's such a good point, too. It's not just, all right, can this guy play? It's can this guy play with, with this, this guy, guy? Right. Can, in all these things? 
We did get a glimpse at the Bam Adebayo, Nikola Jovic minutes. It was something that all of us were also anticipating. Yeah. They played just a handful of minutes together midway through that second quarter. I don't think it went great for them. They were up by 10 at that point. They ended up giving away quite a bit of that lead during those minutes. But also, who cares about the score? Like, right. I know the Heat won this game, and it's cool that they came back in the fourth quarter and all Very that stuff. Very fun for the Kaseya Center crowd. Sure, we got we got preseason pay boss. That's what pay boss. That's always fun. But I... I was really interested to see the Bam and Jovic thing. I didn't really see them interact much on the court and all these things, but it didn't not work either. So it, Jovic, work in progress, I guess. Surprisingly, only played in the first half, did not play in the second so half. So he actually sustained a right knee injury during the game. They told us after the game, uh, he'll be evaluated uh, by doctors on Wednesday afternoon. So we should get some more insight as to why it is that Jovic didn't play the entire second half. So something worth monitoring there. I'm glad yeah. you brought that up. But can we, I feel like we're burying the lead a little bit here. Can we talk about Tyler Hero? Well, you know, my, my takeaway over all this is I, I was trying to, and you and I were talking throughout the game, of course, and, and one of the things that I was thinking about is like, oh, we can't really get much out of this because it's preseason. At the same time, I'm going to lean into the positivity here, and it starts off to your point with Tyler Hero because he looked really, really good. Struggled in some stretches, but otherwise just looked really aggressive in a way that I don't think we've ever really quite seen from him. And yes, there were other complimentary players that had stepped up, Jaime Jaquez, Cole Swider in particular late in the fourth quarter. But Hero's offense, as it was for much of last season, was really what carried Miami and helped him establish a lead. He looked badass out there. He was (laughs) taking shots, no hesitation, deadly from three-point range. Looked really, really really good. The headband looks great, too. I love the headband look. I love headband Hero. Um, Look, yes, the guy who just, like, emptied the clip tonight. And there was a little bit of the, I'll show you kind of thing going with this game. And I am here for that. I love that. It's a great storyline. I love when guys have a chip on their shoulder and play like it. Tried to murder somebody out there with a a breakaway (laughs) tongue. He tried to catch a body at one point and didn't do it. But hey, like John Morant is an all-star because he fails dunks all the time. Like why can't Tyler Hero do it? (laughs) So I I think uh, you could look at the thing and just, ah, he's just, he's a volume shooter. He just took a bunch of shots. He's just sort of was a chucker. He went nine of 22. 22 shots in 24 minutes is a lot of shots, but on a night when there was no Jimmy Butler and no Caleb Martin to a lesser degree, somebody needs to take these shots. And Bam was just sort of doing his preseason Bam thing, six shots in 15 minutes for Bam. So somebody had to take shots. And Cole Swider didn't catch fire until the fourth quarter. So somebody had to do it for the other three quarters, and it very much was Tyler Hero. But like you said, it was the manner with which he got the shots. It was on a lot of different levels, all three levels, some mid-range stuff that's Always going to be expected with Tyler. That's sort of his sweet spot. But also quick trigger from three, coming off screens. Uh, Miami finding him on a couple of Iverson cuts. There were moments where he got all the way to the basket and finished through contact. There was one play in the first quarter where where he he did he finished uh, a floater through contact and then mm-hmm. screamed and he scored uh, I think six six or, or seven of Miami's first fifteen points in the game yeah um, he was huge uh, in terms of setting the tone early and, and getting out to a double digit there lead. was one play that we talked about as we saw it a defensive stop and I can't remember exactly who it was I I, I can't recall which short Hornets play I want to say it was Terry Rozier uh, coming down shot clock late in the shot clock and and. Tyler matched up with him, held his own, mm. forced him into a missed shot as the shot clock expired, and Tyler just pumping his fist, screaming up towards the crowd. We haven't seen that kind of energy and, and just focus on the defensive level, but I think he was actually pretty solid defensively tonight, and, and yeah. again, complimenting his, his great offense. Yeah, the Hornets aren't exactly the most stacked offensive team, but to your point, like he was in the right spot. He was really competing. Eric Spolstra after the game saying like, yeah, he had nine makes. He thought it could have easily been 14 because some of those were in and out. And look, I just like when dudes take shots and when the shots (laughs) themselves are good looks. There wasn't really a whole lot there where I was like, yeah, he probably shouldn't be shooting this. There was one after he kind of caught fire in the first quarter. He check, yeah. Yeah, there was eight or nine seconds left on the shot clock, and he was sprinting like basically out of bounds in the corner and just and, and threw it up there. But hey, we've also seen him make that shot several times. That's kind of like in his bag, so I didn't yeah. mind it. And again, it was a heat check. It was like, you know, he's made a few in a row. You've earned it at that point. So I'm here for it. I'm here for the Tyler Hero empty the clip tour. I'm I'm just I'm all in on this version of headband hero. So <laughs> That was definitely one of the standouts. Um, in terms of the the rotation, um, we can get to it in a little bit, but I do think that Jaime Jaquez uh, might be forcing his way into the rotation. We'll tell you why and whose spot he could be taking after this. 
Today's episode is brought to you by Jace Medical. Everyone should be empowered to care for themselves and their loved ones during the unexpected. And that's why Jace Medical offers the Jace case. The Jace case provides five life-saving antibiotics for emergency use and gives you a peace of mind so that you are not just hoping that you have access to medication in an emergency. Jace Medical makes sure you have the medication in hand. Jace Medical is simple. They handle everything from online evaluation to licensed pharmacy medication delivery and ongoing consultation and care. So don't get caught unprepared. Get $20 off of these life-saving antibiotics today from Jace Medical by using the code Locked on at checkout. That's jacemedical.com, J A S E medical.com. And don't forget to use the code Locked on. Welcome back to Locked on Heat. Thanks for making Locked on Heat your first listen every day. Every day, or if you want a chance to be featured on the show, all you have to do is go to our Instagram page, Locked on Heat on Instagram. Leave us a voice message in our DMs. Uh, with your biggest Miami Heat question, we're going to be trying to do a new version of the mailbag this season where your voice is literally on the show with these voice messages. Should be pretty fun. So again, Locked on Heat, Instagram, leave your voice messages there with your Heat questions. Make sure you're subscribed, of course, on YouTube and on your favorite podcast app. Um, we're going to hold off on credit cookies and blame pie until these games actually matter in the regular season. But in the preseason, for the second segments at, at the end of these games, we're going to do our stock watch. I think that's a better kind of more instructive way to do these things. Especially when he's going 15 deep, you know, and yeah. there's so many different players going up and down, producing at different levels. Absolutely. Stock watch is where it's at. Not right? enough cookies to give around, but uh, <laughs> plenty of stock stock to buy up here. And I think the guy whose stock is on the the rise here is Jaime Hakos Jr. Um, he looked incredible. Just quick box score for him. Uh, 24 minutes. He went five for eight for 13 points, seven rebounds. Uh, two assists. I thought he was terrific in this game, not just from the scoring, which we'll get to here in a second, but running pick and roll in that fourth quarter. Cole Swider, who we'll get to here in a second, was the big scorer in that fourth quarter, but a lot of that was born out of the Jaime Hakas pick and roll with Thomas Bryan or Orlando Robinson in that fourth quarter. And so I thought we saw a lot of different versions of Jaime's game today. Defensively, I thought he was very strong um, against Charlotte's backups, but very strong. Um, just a great night for him, a great debut overall. Yeah. Kinetic, I think, was a word that came to mind for me. He was just a lot of energy out there, constantly in motion, didn't stop, never relented. Defensively, offensively, he was everywhere, crashing the boards, trying to pull down the rebound, coming around, helping on, def on defense, doing whatever he could on offense. Again, with the ball in his hand, I was uh, not expecting him to be the primary ball handler as one as much as he was today, pushing the pace off a of rebound, outlet passes, doing whatever he needed to do to kind of get jumpstart the offense. And he provided this incredible spark in a way that I don't think we've seen many players on this current Heat roster in the last couple of seasons kind of energize the offense to the same degree yeah. as Haikas did today. Really looked polished. And I think the veterans really appreciate that kind of experience that he has as a collegiate player, but also being able to bring a newfound energy and polish to his offensive game. It's a thing that we kept hearing is he plays older than he is. He That's plays right. like a veteran. He plays with great pace and all these things. And we're like, all right, sounds cool. Right. Can we see it? Right. And we saw it tonight. It. There was there was a couple of series there when he had checked in. Uh, runs pick and roll with Bam. Yes. Finds Bam rolling for an easy dunk. And you're like, boom, this guy's already got feel for the game. We're seeing it. It's there. He's getting other guys involved. He's not just looking for his own shot. He's running pick and roll with Miami's second best player. This is awesome. <laughs> Very next play, flows into a dribble handoff, gets it from Bam, Calmly hits a mid-range jumper. Boom, sinks it. Easy peasy. Goes down to the defensive end. Gets a stop. Comes back. Hits a double move. Shows the ball. Ball fake. Spins into the low post and scores. And I'm just like, where is this coming from? Like, yeah. th like the way that he played is so beyond his years. And the thing that impresses me, again, it's the pick and roll stuff. It's the defense. And then he's just like, he already has a bag. And he's got like this old school move. I'm like, I don't even know why he even bothered learning low post moves because nobody does low post moves anymore. But it's straight out of like the Kobe Bryant, Dwayne Wade, Jimmy Butler handbook. And it's not only is it impressive and helpful to the team, like you mentioned, energizing, not just for the team, not just for the offense, but for me as a viewer, I'm just really going to enjoy watching this guy this season because it's such a different flavor of everything else we've been accustomed I, I, to seeing. For as good as Tyler was, I felt the crowd kind of swaying – with more energy every time Hakas did something yeah. because he's just he's a rookie he got a loud cheer when he was introduced into the game and then he just kept it going like he just it looks like he's just fun to watch 
And yeah. there's nothing wrong with embracing that because I know that there's going to be some fine tweaks here and there. He does need to kind of tone it down a little bit. And he's always trying to maybe not force it, but he's always trying to make something happen. And at some points, that's going to lead to a turnover. We saw that from him today. That's fine. He's a rookie. You expect that sort of thing to happen. And it's also preseason players are always going to be a little sloppy. Who cares? Yeah. Right now, he's just fun. He's just fun to watch out there. He's making things happen. You love to see that kind of energy. I don't, I don't, I, I could see how it could be hard for him to play next to Jimmy Butler because of maybe that, yes. that activity. And Jimmy is also very active on the offensive end, kind of cutting and, th- and they could just get in each other's way quite literally. But in that second unit, I think he could be extremely important and extremely important because you look at the guys that he's playing with, not only like obviously his ability to handle the ball and get them I- into offense, but to also score and make stuff happen. Miami's problems when Jimmy Butler is off the court and Bam Adebayo is off the court yeah, and, it, and even when Tyler's off the court, is just like there's nobody that's do, doing anything. Everybody's just sort of waiting for somebody else to do stuff. Right. And to have Jaime out there just doing stuff, I'm okay with the turnovers. I'm okay with him being a little bit wild as long as he's forcing the issue. And I feel like it's such an underrated aspect uh, in basketball. It's like, all right, this guy's making things happen. He's getting the defense to scramble and react. And having that guy coming off your bench – could be extremely important. And look, I know it's just one preseason game, but I'm basing this off of his skill set, the fact that he is a first-round pick, that uh, he could do these things. I don't know that Spo can't have him in the rotation, even as a rookie. There's going to be spots where he needs to put him in. It kind of reminds me a little bit of when Caleb first joined the team. And I think he mm. was that same type of player – really athletic kind of springy a little bit more off the ball doing stuff but yeah it's a good point so i you know i think that kind of evolution of being able to learn how to coexist with jimmy was something that cave of caleb eventually learned and you're going to need that process to take place with Jaime. so there's going to be some growing pains there as you might expect from any rookie eventually i think that high iq the experience and the fact that he's just trying to make something happen in a positive way as long as he's yeah. out there busting his hump and doing all the positive things that he was doing today, it's going to figure itself out. Let's talk about Cole Swider. 17 <laughs> points in the fourth quarter, basically in, responsible for Miami's comeback win tonight. Um, he missed his first uh, three of his first four three-pointers, but then basically made the rest of them. He made five three-pointers in that fourth quarter. Uh, he was awesome. And the thing that all I liked was that he was yeah. playing off of he, – he looked like Duncan Robinson out there. I mean, he really – like you couldn't really tell the difference in the way that they moved and the way, the kind of shots that they were taking off the handoffs and, and off the catch and shoots and all these things. But I love that after he missed so many of those shots that he just kept taking them. And that's – he just he just sort of fits in right away with like the, the green light Miami Heat. Hey, let's just get these three-point shots up. As long as they're decent looks, just put them up. Don't lose confidence. And – Tonight he didn't, and he was a big reason why they won. Yeah, no, I, I think you asked him about that, right? The confidence to keep taking those shots. Yeah. Uh, he looked comfortable out there. That's a kind of a veteran thing, and and look, he really embraced it. He he looked a lot more comfortable. I know his most of his experiences in the G League, but the fact that he's been able to kind of just fit seamlessly here mm-hmm. and have these big moments again, I hate being the one to say take it with a grain of salt because it's preseason. It is preseason, but. To still show the way he has, to be able to move, I think, off ball to get into his spots and then be able to uncork that shot as effortlessly as he did, I think that speaks volumes of where he's at as a player and and kind of just maturely handling the responsibilities. He looked incredibly comfortable out there late in the fourth quarter, taking shots, laying the game to help them seal a victory. Like, that matters. And Spolstra said that, too. Spolstra said, you know what? These things matter, preseason or not. We want to be able to see guys step up in these big moments. And and Swider seems like he's another one who kind of embraces that. The only guy on an E10, only training camp invite to play tonight, right? Champagny, Cech Diallo, Drew Peterson, Alondis Williams, they didn't play. Uh, Cole Swider was the only one. Uh, He's going to be on the roster. He's going to be on the roster. He's not – I'm just telling you. It's either going to be on a two-way or on the 15-man roster. However, it is that there's a lot of things in front of him in the depth chart that kind of have to get sorted out here. But he's going to be on this roster. Like, that's – Translatable done. skill. It's like a, yeah. or something he does, and he does it at a high level. I mean, guys got guys like Jamal Kane and others. Yep. You never want to pick on them necessarily, but they haven't been able to stand out and flash anything that really kind of – makes them a clear asset but with swider when you have that shooting yeah, he's gonna have some off nights between the scrimmage yesterday again not really a big deal and today's preseason game it looks like the makings of an nba player that can put up points when you need him to you need the shooting and the heat <laughs> needs shooting with max Struess leaving obviously still duncan robinson and tyler hero but 
the Heat need as much shooting around Jimmy and Bam as possible. Speaking of Bam, the annual NBA GM survey came out Tuesday. Bam out of bio was a glaring omission in a key category. Plus, I got one more guy whose stock is rising. We're going to talk about that next here on Locked on Heat. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Snap into action this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets. Guaranteed when you place a $5 bet, that's $200 in bonus bets. Win or lose, if you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. The app is so easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn and kick off the NFL season. FanDuel, the official partner of the NFL. Thanks again for making Locked on Heat your first listen every day. Make sure you're subscribed on YouTube and on your favorite podcast app. Before we get to Bam Adebayo and the blatant disrespect (laughs) by other NBA general managers, uh, my last guy whose stock is rising, Thomas Bryant. Yes. Uh, Thomas Bryant, if we are looking for hints about the rotation, if anything, Thomas Bryant is right now the backup center behind uh, behind Bam over Orlando Robinson. He was the guy that checked in uh, before Orlando Robinson did. He played 18, almost 19 important minutes tonight. 15 points on four of seven shooting, went to the line seven times, made all seven of those free throws, got eight rebounds, had a couple of assists, um, and had a block. I thought a really impactful game by him overall. Again, Charlotte's offense is not exactly a juggernaut. I don't think that they put a ton of – I don't think they tested him a lot in terms of his paint defense, which is something that's gotten him in trouble uh, in his previous stops. But I love the fact that this guy could put up 15 points – Spo talking about after the game, how that had been something that they had been specifically looking for. Yep. And the thing I keep coming back to, David, is, look, defensively, yeah, there's going to be concerns. Can the Heat get him better there? That's going to be the big sort of coaching challenge in front of them. But this team just needs guys who can put up points, especially in the regular season. Thomas Bryant barely played in the playoffs for the Denver Nuggets uh, on their championship run last year. I don't really care about that. Well, I'm looking for things that for guys that can just steal you a couple of games in the regular season. Thomas Bryant is a guy who got, uh, who had five times had scored twenty plus points last year in the regular season. He had a thirty one point game at one point. That kind of those kinds of games here and there in in December, January, February could quite literally steal you a few games. And and I think just having him as an option is huge. And then obviously making sure those minutes behind Bam aren't a complete plus minus pit for the Heat is 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 doubly important. Did you notice his defensive? issues there tonight because i i really didn't and i saw i did not on on social media i saw some people criticizing his defense and unfortunately i i don't know if i just by virtue of being in the arena and basically you're focusing on so much going on at the same time you can't really peel back and watch it the way you can on tv i didn't notice it being as glaring as some people made it seem and and again i i was focused on the offensive end of things he looked really polished really good as a score comfortable with that mid-range jumper i'm can tell you right now, teammates love playing with him because he sets crazy screens and he was just knocking guys down. Maybe a little bit more of a cheap shot here and there, <laughs> or at least a moving screen that didn't get called. But he was, yeah. again, letting guys get space there with yeah. the dribble there. And I think that's uh, something that we're going to see a lot more of during the regular season. And, and you're right. Look, you need to have that. And look, uh, Dwayne Dedman or whomever over the last couple of years just hasn't been able to produce that kind of offensive impact off the bench to have a guy like Bryant. I, I am very, very surprised and yet pleasantly. So uh, these are the nights where he's playable. Look, I don't need to see him play poorly in a preseason game defensively to know that he's not a good defender. He's not a good defender. He hasn't been a good defender his entire career. Like that's, I know this already about him, but if he's given you 15 points and by the way, he was a plus 10 tonight. Okay. You live with some of the defensive issues in certain matchups. If he's, if he's able to produce off the bench, like it, he's a backup center. Like this isn't, some sort of perfect player, right? And so kind of going back to guys like Cody Zeller who were just sort of there and, and doing their thing and you grab a couple of rebounds and a couple of box outs and a couple of screens, like sort of in the same vein as, as Jaime Hakas Jr. It's like, all right, at least Thomas Bryant is out there doing stuff, forcing the issue, making things happen. And I just think that he needed more guys that just make stuff happen. And Thomas Bryant is also one of those guys. So we'll see what happens. Yep. And by the way, if he can't play in a certain matchup because he's not holding up defensively, you have Orlando Robinson back there who's already a better defender than yeah, Thomas Bryant. Speaking about it, it's kind of a, a depth other, now. Yeah. Like, like much deeper than it's been in years past. So something to um, Let's talk about Bam. Zero votes for best defender in the NBA GM survey, which was released on Tuesday. A glaring omission when you look at the other guys that were up there. Um, I don't have a problem with Giannis being 
voted the best defender in the NBA. Like, for sure. Like, he definitely has an argument to be made for that. Uh, you and I have argued, and Eric Spolster has argued, and a lot of people have argued that Bam is perhaps the best defender in the NBA. Draymond Green got some votes. He's obviously still up there, too. But it's weird that Bam was an omission in that, but then also voted third most versatile defender in the NBA. And you would think in today's league, of all days of leagues, that that would be maybe the most important aspect in a defender is versatility. I don't get it. I don't know why Bam didn't get votes. And you and I were talking about this before the game. And I'm like, was this just a case where he was like accidentally left off the ballot? And this was just sort of a mistake because it's the only conceivable thing I could think of because he was still voted as the third most versatile defender and didn't get any votes for best of it. Not a single vote. I don't know what to say about it. Cause honestly, I, you should also preface it by saying that our, Miami's GMs can't vote on their own players and coaches. So this has to come from outside of the, you know, other 29 teams as well. I, I think it's something that you and I have talked about before that bam, his versatility is something so visible because he can guard one through five, but it doesn't manifest in any kind of quantifiable statistic that really helps him out. At least not that many, like, a point guard who he switches on to will all of a sudden just pull back his dribble and won't take a shot because he sees the wall of Adebayo in front of him. Right. That's something that's going to show up on a box score. He's Darrell Rivas. Yeah. He's a lockdown corner that's like right. at his prime. It's just like he doesn't get any picks because right. nobody throws to him. Exactly. So uh, it's a good point. It's a good comparison. Um, there's not enough blocks, steals, those kind of quantifiable stats to say, oh, this is how you measure his good defense. It sucks and it is what it is. Uh, Eric Spolster you, before the game on a long rant about not rant I shouldn't say but a long kind of just frustrated explanation about why Bam when should, he was asked about him being voted like seventy three percent of the votes best coach in the NBA just yeah. runaway dominance best coach in the NBA he was like I don't know but Bam not being but like and went on that went yeah. on that spiel yeah yeah no absolutely he said he asked somebody in PR it was like well where did Bam rank in the GM survey and then we told him he didn't get it and he was just like I I can't understand. I think he's the best defender in the NBA. That's what he said. You and I yeah. both agree there. Very, very stunning, strange. Look, I don't know that GMs can watch as closely here. So sometimes you just kind of have to focus on some of these other statistics so that they can help. Well, the other part of support. this too is I don't, I don't think that Daryl Morey is taking time out of his day to fill this out. This is sort <laughs> of the intern's support. job yeah. a lot. Uh, and and to your point, like you know. Maybe the guy getting coffee isn't as plugged in uh, to watching Miami Heat games and seeing Bam's lockdown cornerback style of defense as, hey, Jaron Jackson Jr. has a lot of blocks. You know what I mean? So the the best defensive player in the NBA, that's the question. Here's Here are the results from the NBA GM survey. Giannis got 40% of the votes. I'm fine with that. If you want, if you think Giannis is the best, and Spo, I should totally say, Spo said that he says, I just want Bam to be in that conversation. Yeah. Whether it's one A or one B, whatever. At the end of the day, that's just nitpicking. But he has to yep. be in the conversation. The fact that he isn't is just mind boggling. Drew Holiday got 13% of the votes. Just I'm telling you, he's winning Defensive Player of the Year this year. The Boston Media Mafia is already at work here. Drew Holiday is a great defender, but second, I don't know. Uh, Draymond Green tied for third uh, with 10% of the vote. No problem there. Marcus Smart, still, I guess, residue Boston Media Mafia influence there. Got 10% of the vote. Jaron Jackson got 7% of the vote. Kawhi, who does not play basketball games, uh, got 7% of the vote. And then also receiving votes. Alex Caruso, Anthony Davis, Lou Dort. He tries a lot. Like, what are we doing here? Rudy, I, I like Lou Dort fine, but best defender in the league? Uh, and then Rudy Gobert, who, I, I don't know, I guess, still get, he's still a very good defender. It's fine. Um, that's wild to me. Like, Bam is better than easily. He's easily top three. It's never going to show up. Easily top three, and I would probably up. argue top two. So it's okay. But then again, like you look at uh, the the most versatile defender in the NBA, you've got Giannis number one. Again, I have no problem with that. Draymond number two. It's Draymond, Hall of Fame defender. Can't argue with it. How if the hell want is Jaron Jackson Jr. one of the most versatile defenders? Uh, I don't know. I guess they didn't watch the World Cup. Bam is number I, three, I, making an appearance, and then Mikal Bridges is four. Jaron Jackson Jr. is there, and then also receiving votes, Dylan Brooks, Paul George, Aaron Gordon, Marcus Smart, Aaron Gordon, nice little shout out for him. I think he is underrated in that regard. But um, Bam is there with a bunch of guys who showed up on the best defender list, except for him. So it's just, it doesn't quite add up. And I get, I keep going, I think it, it had to be some sort of clerical error. It just had to be because there's no rhyme or reason vote. behind it. One vote, one vote. The guy who voted for Lou Dort 
like couldn't vote for Bam. It just he must have not been on the drop. I I'm telling you, had to be. There's the only conceivable way I could think about this because everybody who didn't at least cast a single vote for Bam, whoever voted for Lou Dort over Bam, should just get fired. Like that's not even if it wasn't a clerical error. It's the only logical explanation here. Maybe it's just a very simplistic scouting report on bam he's very versatile as a defender but it maybe doesn't translate into anything but it's not good versatility like it doesn't make any sense it's like he's super versatile but he's just like it doesn't matter yeah I, who cares They're and then meanwhile the miami heat voted second best defensive team eric Strollstra has the best Somehow, defensive schemes and all these own. things are so important and, and and made possible by bam that i don't get it so you know what more chip on the shoulder for bam I still I don't think that this takes him out of the running for defensive player of the year. If anything, it might help his case because it might shine a light on, oh my God, I think we forgot about Bam. Well, it's not the GMs that are going to be voting on the defensive player of the that's year. That's true so too. That's part of it. I mean, it's the media who doesn't necessarily watch Miami. And again, they can't point to a statistical category and say, Oh yeah, this is where he dominates. The media vote the media watches more Miami and appreciates Bam more than the general managers do, I guess. Absolutely. Well, I mean that bar At least he got low. votes for defensive player of the year. He got consideration. He's not even on the ballot this time, so yeah. Uh, strange, I guess. Yeah, I don't know that we'll ever get to the bottom of it. I don't know that anybody outside of Miami cares. Thanks for making Locked On Heat your first listen every day. Hit that subscribe button on YouTube. Follow us on your favorite podcast app. 